welcome to lecture series on advanced geotechnical engineering course offered by IIT Bombay. We are in module 3 compressibility and consolidation. So this is the lecture 5 on compressibility and consolidation and we have introduced ourselves in previous lectures stresses in soil from the surface loads and we also discussed about the Terzaghi's one dimensional consolidation theory and application in different boundary conditions and what will happen if you are having a constant rate of loading or ramp loading. Then we proceed further how we can actually determine the consolidation characteristics in the laboratory particularly by using iodometer tests. Then we will introduce ourselves to normally and war consolidated soils and then we will try to discuss about a typical laboratory virgin compression curve. Then we will try to look into the, the determination of the coefficient of consolidation, what are the different methods which are available and all. So in the previous lecture we have discussed about the instantaneous loading wherein the at time t is equal to 0 itself the load will be assumed to be acting on the surface of the load, surface of the soil. But in reality or in practice this placement of this load takes or occurs over a period of time. So if that is done in single or constant rate it is called constant, road, uh, constant rate loading or single stage ramp loading or if it is done in two stages or bund is constructed in two stages then it is called uh, two stage ramp loading. So in this particular slide the comparison of uh, constant uh, rate of loading and uh, uh, instantaneous uh, loading which is actually discussed by Sevokugan et al 2014 wherein they said that the average degree of consolidation at any time is significantly less for constant rate loading than the instantaneous loading. So the average degree of consolidation at any time is significantly uh, less for the constant rate loading than for the instantaneous loading. So this is for the instant uh, instantaneous loading if you theoretically if you assume this is what we get but constant rate loading uh, we get the u versus uh, t plot or u degree of consolidation versus tv plot for instantaneous and uh, constant loading is shown here and this is the time factor and this is the degree of consolidation. So the average degree of consolidation at any time is significantly less for the, uh, the constant rate loading than the instantaneous loading. Now we try to look into the response of soil for the you know the stress controlled stresses which are applied like if you are having sandy soils we said that you know the sands undergo compression relatively faster. So in this particular slide E versus sigma dash and compression time plots for sand are shown here. So as can be seen here within a short span of time of one or two minutes the sand undergoes the compression. If you are having a loose sand and a dense sand you can see that the loose sand reduces its void ratio from 0 0.75 to, uh, to, to somewhere around 0 0.5, 0 0.52 or so. In case of dense sand there will be less uh, uh, you know uh, the reduction in the void ratio but at ultimately at uh, the larger effective stresses. Uh, they tend to be uh, towards the same void ratio. So the sand deposit uh, uh, compresses immediately on load application, sand uh, deposit uh, the response is uh, very uh, instantaneous and loose sand compresses uh, uh, more than dense sand and loose and dense sand deposits tend toward the same void ratio. So this particular slide uh, you know illustrates the response of uh, uh, you know you know the uh, the sand particularly loose in dense sand for the applied loading whereas if you look into for a clay or a fine grained soil uh, 
uh, where, where the soil has, is having very low permeability uh, the compression uh, varies uh, with time and it takes place over a long period of time. So even after 10 minutes uh, you know the degree of uh, compression is actually very very less. So it can be seen that uh, you know it takes a long time for undergoing compression for a given uh, load. Similarly here the void ratio uh, reduces uh, relatively less where at 50 kilo Pascal's pressure and uh, tries to reduce uh, you know uh, when we start increasing the pressure and even at uh, 250 kilo Pascal's the void residue reduction is only 0.6. So these are actually shown uh, you know just to uh, uh, as an example uh, how the E sigma dash and compression time plots uh, will be there for clay and uh, time dependent compression takes longer time uh, compared to sand and the magnitude of compression is also large for uh, clays. So we need to understand that the magnitude of compression is large and it also takes uh, over a long period of time. So if before looking into the idometer or consolidation test let us re-look into the definition once again. If the soil is of low permeability the application of a surface load results in an increase in pore water pressure. So the resulted increase in pore water pressure gives rise to a hydraulic gradient and in response to which the pore water flows out of the soil and the soil deforms. And as the water flows out of the soil the pore water pressures gradually uh, return to their equilibrium values and after which no further deformation takes place. This is what we are actually we have been discussing about the, the consolidation phenomenon. So the process of deformation of the soil over time due to the dissipation of non equilibrium pore water pressures is termed as consolidation and again the compression is used to describe changes in volume due to changes in uh, sigma dash without reference to the time scale over which they occur. So compression and consolidation here in, in case of consolidation the process of deformation of the soil over time due to the dissipation of non equilibrium pore water pressures is termed as consolidation and compression is used to describe the changes in volume due to changes in uh, sigma dash that is effective stress without reference to the time scale for which they occur. So uh, in order to determine the consolidation uh, characteristics in the laboratory uh, the, the test which is uh, used is called idometer test or consolidometer test and in this slide uh, a typical idometer is shown and uh, wherein uh, this is uh, uh, the, the, characteristics, the characteristics of a soil during one dimensional consolidation or swelling can be determined by means of uh, the idometer test. The name Ido, Idema is actually uh, you know derived from uh, Latin uh, the Greek word that is uh, swelling the Idema means uh, swelling. So the characteristics of a soil during one dimensional consolidation or swelling can be determined by means of the idometer test. So hence the, the name idometer has come like this and the idometer test or consolidometer test is actually used for uh, you know, um, you know uh, getting the uh, you know the uh, compressibility characteristics or consolidation characteristics of soil samples in remolded state or in uh, uh, undisturbed state. So uh, generally the samples are actually uh, you know the having uh, you know the porous stone here and the porous stone you know the pore water pressure increase in porous stone is 0 which is actually similar to the open layers at top and bottom and this is the moving load loading plate and one interesting thing we should note here is that this confining ring is actually rigid enough and will not actually allow the lateral deformation hence you know whatever the strain which actually undergoes is axial in strain. So if you, uh, if you are not allowing the uh, epsilon r that is radial strain then it turns out to be uh, epsilon r is equal to 0 so epsilon a will become uh, epsilon v and uh, in order to uh, you know inundate under water all these uh, this uh, is water is actually filled up till here and uh, the sample is allowed to consolidate under a given volume under given load. So the load is also in order to apply large pressures up to let us say 800 kilo Pascals or 1600 kilo Pascals 
we, uh, in the liver arm technique is actually used in the laboratory. So, the idometer or consolidation test in this test the stress is applied to the soil specimen along the vertical axis and uh, while strain in the horizontal direction is prevented that is uh, is actually shown here the no horizontal movement and uh, the sample to the thickness to the diameter that original thickness to the diameter is uh, normally maintained as uh, 3 the T by D uh, is about the ratio is uh, uh, 1 by 3 or you can say diameter to thickness ratio is maintained as 3 and uh, this is so uh, the cylindrical sample of thickness T and diameter D that is T by D approximately equal to 1 by 3 is confined in a metallic ring and uh, loaded with a vertical axial pressure. So, due to the rigidity of the metallic ring the radial strain of the sample epsilon r is equal to 0. So, epsilon r means that uh, in this direction in the radial direction will be 0. Uh, since the axial strain is epsilon a is not equal to 0 the thus the epsilon a is exactly equal to the volumetric strain. So, epsilon a is equal to epsilon v and the confining ring imposes a condition of 0 lateral strain on the specimen and the ratio of lateral to vertical effective stress being k naught. So, sigma v is equal to sigma a is equal to k naught sigma r that is sigma r is the radial stress. So, uh, there are attempts by the several investigators to measure uh, the lateral resistance offered by the ring uh, by placing some strain gauges and load cells and all. Uh, in the idometer test uh, we need to uh, look into there the two types of idometers are there one is called uh, fixed ring idometer and, uh, and floating ring idometer or idometer with uh, fixed confining ring or idometer with the floating floating confined ring. The major experimental difficulty with the idometer test is side friction that is the uh, wall friction. So, the shear stresses develop along the cylindrical surface of the specimen as the vertical strain occurs. So, as the vertical strain occurs uh, you know the uh, cylindrical uh, you know surface of the specimen the stresses shear stresses actually develop along the cylindrical surface of the specimen as the vertical strains occur. So, the presence of the side friction disturbs the one dimensional state of strain and prevents some of the axial force from reaching the bottom portion of the specimen. So, the presence of the side friction uh, disturbs the one dimensional state of the strain and uh, prevents some of the axial force from reaching the bottom portion of the specimen. So, to minimize uh, you know the effect of the side friction forces. Uh, the thickness diameter ratio. So, one of the reasons why uh, you know um, the diameter to thickness ratio is maintained as 3 is that you know to minimize the side friction forces. So, to minimize the, the side friction forces the thickness to diameter of the specimen is kept as as small as practicable. So, that is uh, maintained as 1 is to 3 and the use of the idometer with the floating ring container also helps to minimize the effect of the siding fric side friction. So, that uh, you know the ring will not offer any uh, resistance. So, use of the idometer with the floating ring uh, container also helps to minimize the effects of side friction and many attempts have been made to minimize the side friction through the use of lubricants and uh, plastic liner sheets. So, by using the plastic liner sheets or uh, by using the lubricants the side friction uh, can be reduced this was actually attempted by several investigators. Uh, so, uh, basically uh, the many quotes they recommend uh, uh, these uh, fixed ring idometer and uh, with uh, thickness to diameter ratio uh, as uh, 1 is to 3 uh, basically this helps to uh, you know uh, limit the side friction uh, forces. In addition to this uh, the walls walls of the internal in of the confining ring can be uh, lubricated. So, that uh, you know the side friction forces can be minimized. So, here in this particular slide uh, this is idometer with the fixed ring. So, the ring uh, is actually fixed here and in this case the idometer uh, is actually provided with a floating ring you can see that the idometer is provided with a floating ring here. So, there is no connection between the base plate and uh, the floating ring in this case the ring is actually attached rigidly uh, to the base plate. 
So in the fixed ring idometer the friction gradually decreases to 0 towards the bottom so as the load is actually high here the friction uh, you know will be very high here and reduces to 0 to the bottom of the specimen. In case of a uh, uh, floating ring uh, idometer the plane of uh, 0 friction that is the neutral plane is at the middle of the sample because the sample is compressed from the both sides. So as the sample is compressed from both the sides as a reaction is actually offered from here and here the in the case of a floating ring the neutral plane will be at the uh, its mid plane. So a floating ring idometer has the plane of plane of zero friction at the middle of the sample because the sample is compressed from the both the sides as the sample is compressed from both the sides so floating ring idometer has the plane of zero friction at middle of the sample because the sample is compressed from both the sides. In the case of uh, fixed ring idometer the friction gradually decreases to 0 uh, towards the bottom so maximum here and then reduce to 0. So the uh, process of the or procedure of the idometer test is described in this slide the whole assembly uh, with the confining ring and the, uh, in other accessories uh, the which sits in an open cell of water to which the pore water pressure in the specimen has free access and the initial pressure will depend upon the type of soil then a sequence of pressures is applied to the specimen and each being double the previous value. So why it is required to be doubled why not you know what will happen if you are actually having you know more than the double value but what will happen if it is less than the you know the uh, designated uh, if suppose if sigma 1 sigma a pressure of p1 is applied if it is not applied uh, to p1 uh, or if it is applied less than 2 p1 what will happen all those things we will discuss uh, subsequently but here uh, we can take it as the initial pressure will depend upon the type of soil so for example if the soil is at its liquid limit and uh, uh, you know we cannot actually apply very high pressure so the pressure has to be as low as possible then sequence of pressures is applied to the specimen each being double to the previous value and each pressure is normally maintained for a period of 24 hours. So here also we will discuss about what will happen if the same load is maintained for more than 24 hours or 7 days what will happen or if it is you know removed within 24 hours what will happen. So in exceptional cases a period of 48 hours may be required. So for some certain type of soils uh, exceptional cases a uh, 48 hours is required otherwise a uh, 24 hours uh, you know period is actually normally maintained and the compression readings being observed at suitable intervals during this period. So for each load what we need to is that we have to uh, observe the uh, compression time versus compression and moment the uh, you know at the end of the 24 hour before uh, applying the new load we need to uh, note down the compression value and the load need to be applied uh, uh, carefully and the actual stress is varied in a stress control manner. So in the idometer test the consolidation test the actual stress is varied in a stress controlled manner. So at the end of the in increment period when the excess pore water has completely dissipated the applied pr pressure equals the effective vertical stress in the specimen. So at the end of the increment period when the excess pore water pressure has completely dissipated the applied pressure equals the effective vertical stress in the specimen. So in this particular slide time dependent plot during the consolidation for a given load increment is shown for a given load increment it can be a pressure of say P1. So this is the deformation initially the sample actually has higher thickness and let us say higher void ratio and it undergoes compression and then you can see that there is a, a straight line portion is actually extending up to certain extent and then uh, you know it tends to uh, have another curvature and then tends to uh, go towards the this. So we can see that there are three stages are there the, in the process of consolidation one is uh, defined as a, a stage one and the stage two is actually called as which is the major part which is actually called primary consolidation. So mostly when the consolidation phenomenon means but stage 1 and stage 2 is considered and stage 3 the secondary consolidation for certain type of soils is very very prominent like examples like peat and which is non like soil non like soil means 
uh, you know the municipal solid waste which actually undergoes very high amount of creep. So, stage 1, stage 2 and stage 3 these are the you know 3 stages of consolidation. So, initially the uh, you know occurs because of the uh, readjustment of the particles and some elastic uh, uh, strains or raveling of the particles actually takes place. In stage 2 basically in the primary consolidation where the soil undergoes the particles undergoes uh, irre irrecoverable uh, you know uh, changes and in the secondary consolidation under the constant effective stress the, the load is not a, the uh, you know wild ratio continues to fall. So, this is because of the certain nature of the soil. So, this actually is uh, prevalent. So, the, the stage 1 is actually basically mostly caused by preloading and in stage 2 which is uh, primary consolidation the excess pore water pressure is gradually transferred to effective stress by the expulsion of pore water. So, excess pore water pressure is gradually transferred into the effective stress uh, by the expulsion of pore water and stage 3 basically this commences at the end of uh, you know primary com, uh, consolidation. So, this occur after the complete dissipation of excess pore water pressure for a given load and this is caused by the plastic adjustment of the soil fabric that means that the soil fabric is nothing but the soil grain structures. So, readjustment of the uh, soil fabric actually happens here and uh, because of that this uh, secondary consolidation or a stage 3 takes place. So, here in this uh, particular uh, slide uh, the successive load increments of height high versus log time are shown. So, the pressures are typically like uh, we can one can actually start with uh, uh, 5 kilo Pascals and 10 kilo Pascals or you can say that 12.5, 25, 50 you can see that the uh, load increments are actually always uh, doubled here 50, 100, 200, 400, 800 and 1600 kilo Pascals. So, each time the sample undergoes uh, consolidation and reaches to the new thickness and uh, to the new effective stress like that you can see that uh, the sample undergoes the reduction in the thickness. So, this actually happens by the same uh, you know solids will remain same, but only thing is that the water which is there in the, uh, the three phase system of the soil will get uh, uh, expelled out. So, the basically the results of this hydrometer uh, are presented uh, by plotting the thickness of the specimen or the percentage change in the thickness like we can say that percentage change in the thickness if it is the thickness is uh, uh, you know let us say delta h which is a change delta h by h uh, or which is nothing but uh, you know the uh, strain actual strain uh, the plotted in the, the thickness uh, this the results are plotted uh, by plotting the uh, the results are presented by plotting the thickness of the specimen or the void ratio at the end of the each increment against the corresponding effective stress. So, the effective stress may be plotted either natural or logarithmic scale. So, preferably these curves which are when you plot with uh, E and uh, uh, effective stress is generally plotted with uh, E log sigma or it is also uh, E log sigma dash or E log P curves. So, if desired the expansion of the specimen can be measured under the successive decreases in applied pressure. So, once the sample has been subjected to loading and uh, unloading the sample and the, during the process of unloading the sample undergoes expansion. So, uh, if desired the expansion of the sample specimen can be measured under successive decrease in uh, decreases in the applied pressure. However, even, even if the spelling characteristics of soil are not required the expansion of the specimen due to the removal of the final pressure should be measured. Uh, so, even if the swelling uh, characteristics of soil are not required the expansion of the specimen due to the removal of the final pressure should be measured. So, here in this uh, particular uh, uh, slide uh, how the uh, you know the analysis can be done uh, you know. So, for example, here is a three phase system uh, two phase system where water and solids and with this uh, the volume is 1 plus uh, E naught and uh, so initially height is H naught and uh, this actually changes to uh, because the volume this, uh, this, this uh, thickness reduces to H naught minus delta H. So, delta epsilon v the change in volumetric strain is nothing but delta h by h naught which is nothing but delta e by 1 plus e naught. So, which is nothing but delta e by 1 plus e naught. Since the specimen of the soil is only due to the change in void ratio the vertical strain delta epsilon v can be expressed in terms of the void ratio of the soil specimen at different stages of the test. 
and the void ratio at, a, at the end of each increment period can be calculated from the dial gauge readings and either the water content or the dry weight of the specimen uh, at the end of the test. So, since the settlement of the soil is only due to the change in void ratio, the vertical strain delta epsilon v can be expressed in terms of void ratio of the soil sample at different stages of the test. So, we can actually say that delta h by h naught where h naught is the initial thickness uh, is equal to delta e by 1 plus e naught, e naught is the original or initial void ratio. So, here the procedure is actually given water content measured at the end of the test W1, water void ratio at the end of the test because it is under completely saturation. So, E is E1 is equal to W1 Gs moment once you know the water content at the end of the test by knowing the specific gravity of the solids we can actually calculate what is the void ratio at the end of the test and the thickness of the sample at the specimen at the start of the test is H0 and the change in thickness is delta H. So, void ratio at the start of the test is E0 and which actually changes to E1 plus delta E. So, delta E by uh, 1 plus E0 is equal to delta H by H0. We can write like uh, delta E by delta H is equal to 1 plus E0 by H0. So, in the same way delta E can be calculated up to the end of any increment period. Then in the second step uh, the dry weight measured at the end of the test that is uh, mass of the solids and thickness uh, at the end of any increment period uh, uh, is say H1. So, area of the specimen is A. So, equivalent thickness of the solids we can actually get as Hs is equal to Ms by Ags uh, rho w. So, with that what we get is that uh, uh, once by know the equivalent thickness of the solids E1 is equal to H1 uh, which is the thickness at uh, end of uh, any increment period minus Hs by Hs. So, H1 by uh, uh, H1 by Hs is equal to 1 h1 by hs minus 1. So, e1 is nothing but h1 by hs minus 1. So, in the iodometer test here the um, first e versus sigma dash curves are shown on the left hand side of the uh, uh, plot, uh, slide we, we see the isotropic compression curves where uh, sigma 1 is equal to sigma 3 the sample is actually compressed in all directions uh, identically. So, this is this state is called isotropic compression and this is confined compression vertically you can see that this is you know the sample is restrained and laterally and confined in the vertical direction. So, then the deformation actually occurs in the vertical direction. So, you can see that the distinctly different you know the E sigma dash plots for the isotropic compression and confined compression can be seen. So, here there is, is here also there is a you know compression takes place and the sample unloading is taking place and reloading is taking place and again the sample is undergoing compression. Here you can see that the sample is undergoing uh, compression and uh, unloading and then reloading. So, compression unloading and reloading and then it is actually again uh, going into the compression mode. So, this is uh, this plot actually showing the initial compression followed by the expansion and recompression and the, sh the shape of the curves are related to the, the stress tree of the the related to the, the stress history of the clay. And here uh, as a result of the iodometer test what we get is that we get E sigma dash or void ratio effective stress relationships on either an arithmetic uh, scale or in the logarithmic scale. So, you can see that initial part is uh, flat and then there is a, a steep portion which actually commences here and then uh, once we uh, unload here after reaching certain pressure and uh, the sample undergoes expansion and then uh, the sample uh, is subjected to recompression and then goes into the uh, com uh, compression mode again here. So, this straight line portion uh, this portion is called the virgin compression for a uh, soil and the slope of this uh, virgin compression curve is actually called as compression index. The slope of this virgin, virgin compression curve is actually called as this uh, you know virgin compression curve is called as the compression index and uh, and this is uh, uh, this is actually uh, this portion is a, this is called recompression index or this is also called as the recompression index and this is actually called the swelling index that is called swelling index when the load is being relieved and you can see that this is the uh, the initial void ratio and uh, this is the void ratio so this as the uh, in the process of this uh, application of this load 
as the soil particles or grains have been subjected to uh, you know the uh, continuous rearrangement of the particles and then irrecoverable changes have been subjected because of that what will happen is that the sample cannot actually uh, you know uh, meet this particular uh, point in the sense that you know it will uh, it never be you know possible to achieve the same again. So uh, this is the unique uh, for a given uh, soil for a given uh, type of soil uh, or a clay wherein you can see that this straight line portion and then there is a, a change in curvature here and then this portion is actually is called the uh, you know the compression this gives the uh, virgin compression uh, this is virgin compression curve and the slope of that is actually called as compression index. So the E log sigma dash relationship for a normally consolidated clay is linear and the E log sigma dash relationship for a normally consolidated clay is linear or nearly so and is actually called as the virgin compression curve because the that uh, uh, E log sigma dash relationship for a normally consolidated clay is linear and it, uh, it is called as the virgin compression line. If the clay is water consolidated its state will be represented by a point on the specimen uh, on the point on the expansion or recompression parts of the e, sig e log sigma dash plot. The recompression curve ultimately joins the virgin compression line and further compression uh, then occurs along the uh, virgin line. So it uh, joins banks backs to the, the original virgin line and during the compression the changes in soil structure continuously take place and the clay does not revert to the original structure during the expression. So do as during the uh, uh, you know compression uh, you know the during the compression the changes in soil structure continuously take place and the clay does not uh, revert back to the original structure during the uh, expansion. And the plots show that the clay in water consolidated state will be much less compressible. So one can see that in the recompression state the sample will be less compressible than the normally consolidated state. So basically in the previous slide we have seen that plots show that the clay is water consolidated in the clay in the water consolidated state will be much less compressible than that in the normally consolidated state. Uh, then we will try to look into the define the different parameters like we have introduced ourselves to uh, while discussing the theory of one dimensional consolidation the coefficient of volume compressibility and this can be obtained uh, by using iodometer test and uh, this is nothing but uh, mv is nothing but uh, av by 1 plus e naught where av is nothing but coefficient of uh, compressibility which is uh, uh, delta E by delta sigma dash. So it is defined as the volume change per unit volume in uh, per unit increase in effective stress. So uh, this is uh, coefficient of volume compressibility is defined as the volume change per unit volume per unit increase in the effective stress and the units are for the MV are meter square per kilo Newton or meter square for mega Newtons. And the volume change may be expressed in terms of either void ratio or specimen thickness. If for an increase in effective stress from sigma naught dash to sigma 1 dash the, effect, the void ratio decreases from E naught to E1. So we can actually say that here initial void sample thickness is say H naught and the after certain compression the sample thickness reduced to H1. So H naught minus H1 is delta H and HS is the height of the solids. So MV is nothing but uh, e naught minus E1 by sigma 1 dash minus sigma naught dash that is delta E by uh, you know delta sigma dash uh, by uh, you know this uh, 1 plus E naught that is the uh, you know this uh, uh, you know 1, 1 plus E naught. So this is actually given as uh, MV is equal to 1 by H naught into H naught minus H1 by sigma 1 dash minus sigma naught dash. So the volume the value of MV for a particular soil is not constant but depends upon the stress range or which uh, uh, which is calculated. So the value of MV so this is actually used in settlement calculations also and once we know the MV value uh, we can actually calculate uh, the estimate the settle consolidation settlements. So the value of uh, MV of a particular soil is not constant but depends upon the stress range or which this is calculated. And uh, as we have actually discussed uh, in the, uh, the slope of this virgin compression curve is actually called as uh, uh, compression index and here different portions of the curve is shown here 1, 2, 3 and 4. 
So here the soil is described as normally consolidated uh, when its uh, state exists on the steeper line. So 1 and 4 so th this is actually called as normally consolidated and soil described as war consolidated when it occurs on the flatter portion that is 2 and 3 here. So it can be like uh, after here when the unloading takes place again it will be less flatter than this one. So th this process actually continues uh, it undergoes continuously. So here the compression index is uh, defined as the, the slope of the linear portion of the E log sigma dash plot and is dimensionless and uh, for any two points on the linear portion of the plot we can actually find out E0 and what is sigma naught dash that is the corresponding uh, sigma naught dash E1 or uh, this corresponding sigma 1 dash. So CC is nothing but E0 minus E1 divided by logarithmic of sigma 1 dash minus sigma naught dash. So the rearrangement of the soil particles uh, uh, you know in the in this portion the rearrangement of the soil particles takes place at per permanent or irrecoverable uh, changes takes place and elastic strains in particles are uh, par partially recoverable and compression of bounded water layers is recoverable. So uh, in this uh, particular uh, slide what we have seen is that the definition of the compression index and uh, in how this can be determined and uh, we also have seen that uh, the normally consolidated and war consolidated uh, terms we have been introduced. So we will actually look into that how these terms can be defined. Before that we actually have to look into the another uh, output from the uh, consolidation test or hydrometer test is uh, pre consolidation pressure. So Casagrande proposed an empirical uh, construction to obtain uh, uh, pre consolidation pressure from the E log sigma dash curve for an war consolidated clay uh, the maximum uh, effective vertical stress that has acted in the clay in the past referred to as the pre consolidation pressure. So the maximum effective vertical stress that has acted on the clay in the past referred to as, uh, as the pre consolidation pressure. So, pre, uh, so here once we have got the, the data is plotted for E void ratio and logarithmic of sigma dash. So we actually have got uh, you know the um, you know the portion A B and then portion B C and this is relatively a straight portion. Uh, so we, we have not taken uh, uh, unloading and reloading uh, components. So here uh, this actually portion is shown here. So the in order to determine the pre consolidation pressure of a given soil suppose if you are have if you can actually get an undisturbed uh, sample from the side and then if the test is actually done uh, without much uh, sample disturbance then there is a possibility that we will be able to assess what is its uh, what was the you know the the stress the soil has been subjected in the past. So the procedure is like this uh, first what we need to do is that we have to draw a tangent to the straight line portion of the E log sigma dash curve extend this uh, backward. So extend this tangent backward and secondly what we have to do is that we have to locate a point D uh, of the maximum curvature on the recompression part of the AB curve. So this involves uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, you know judgment and uh, by, uh, by proper judgment the determination of the point D of the maximum curvature of the recompression part AB of the curve uh, can be obtained. So um, you know then we have to draw the horizontal uh, which is parallel to the uh, logarithmic of sigma dash axis uh, through point D and a draw a tangent uh, passing through D. So and bisect an angle between this uh, you know this uh, tangent which is actually drawn through this uh, point D which is located on the maximum curvature point of the E log sigma dash curve and uh, this horizontal and uh, one the point where this uh, you know the extended back tangent of the linear portion of this compression curve wherever it meets this bisected line passing through point D and when you drop the vertical line below and that gives the sigma c dash or pc uh, is called pre consolidation pressure. So the vertical through the point of the intersection of the bisector and the cb produces the approximate value of the pre consolidation pressure. So with this uh, procedure which is actually given by uh, Casagrande we can actually obtain what is the uh, you know the pre consolidation pressure and what was the, the stress of a soil what was the stress the soil would have been subjected in the past. 
So uh, the preconsolidation pressure, uh, as we just now seen, how this can be determined in the laboratory. So it is the pressure, uh, it is the previous maximum effective stress to which the soil has been subjected in the past. So here we actually introduced ourselves to two terms, and we have been actually discussing that uh, the normally consolidated and more consolidated soils. A normally consolidated soil is nothing but a soil is called as normally consolidated. If the present effective overburden pressure is the maximum to which the soil has ever been subjected, so a soil is said to be normally consolidated if the effective present effective overburden pressure is the maximum pressure to which the soil has ever been subjected. That is, sigma dash present the present effective stress is less than is greater than or equal to sigma dash past maximum. Sigma dash present greater than or equal to sigma dash past maximum and war consolidated soil is defined like this a soil is called as war consolidated if the present effective war burden pressure is less than the maximum to which the soil was ever been subjected in the past that means that sigma dash past maximum is much more than the sigma dash present that is sigma dash present is less than the sigma dash past maximum. So in the natural condition in the field the soil may be normally consolidated or war consolidated. So mostly the uh, you know in India the along the coastal uh, uh, you know the our peninsula mostly the soils which are actually there are normally consolidated in nature and uh, in, in case of uh, you know Europe and uh, other countries uh, because of the, the glaciation and other natures. Uh, you know the soils uh, can actually be in the war consolidated state. So uh, in along the coastal line the most of these uh, soils uh, they remain in uh, normally consolidated state in, uh, in the Indian peninsula. So, uh, so in a natural condition in the field a soil may be in either normally consolidated or war consolidated and normally consolidated uh, we say that when the sigma dash present is greater than or equal to sigma dash uh, past maximum. And war consolidated, we will say that sigma dash present is less than sigma dash past maximum. So, a soil in the field may become war consolidated if the soil when the continuous deposit is actually taking place, it can actually become war consolidated through several mechanisms. First is that you know a structure may, may might have been existing till today, but may not be there. So, the past structures and removal of the war burden pressure, removal of the war burden pressure or glaciation and deep pumping that deep pumping of uh, uh, and the desiccation due to drying mostly in the uh, waters zone and the upper portion of the soil. The soil is actually uh, said as uh, said to be in the war consolidated state and that is because of the desiccation due to drying. And the desiccation due to plant lift the lift of water in the waters zone. And this can also cause you know the over consolidated state to the soil and the change in soil structure due to secondary compression and the change in the pH value and the salt concentration and change in temperatures and weathering ion exchange and precipitation of cementing agents. Suppose if the cementing agents are getting precipitated into the soil deposit and it also lead to the formation of over consolidated soils. So particularly you know what we can say that the, the glaciation uh, and the past structures or removal of the war burden pressures are the, the major uh, causes for the soil deposits to change into war consolidated state for the particularly the deep uh, soil status. And uh, uh, the other uh, things what we call what we come across uh, in normally is that in hard crust what this is basically because of the desiccation due to drying this will be in the war consolidated state naturally. So, Whenever possible, the preconsolidation pressure for an ore consolidation should not exceed the in the construction. Whenever possible, the preconsolidation pressure for an ore consolidated clay should not exceed in construction. If that is the case, then it will undergo settlements again. It will go into uh, you know the uh, compression again, and the soils will be subjected to irrecoverable changes again. The compression will not usually be great, great if the effective vertical stress uh, remains below sigma dash c. And only sigma dash c is exceeded, uh, compression will be large. If sigma dash uh, c is exceeded, then only compression will be large. So, if the given, for example, if you are having a certain soil, and if you are actually trying to construct, say, one or two floor building, and uh, the compression may not actually 
uh, you know will be will, will be there and if the so if this does not uh, cause uh, you know serious problem within the, uh, the design life of the structure then may not be issue so compression will not usually be great if the effective vertical stress remains below the sigma dash sigma c dash and if sigma da, if only if sigma c dash is exceeded the compression will be large then we are actually trying to determine one more term which is called as uh, ocr OCR is nothing but uh, ratio of sigma sigma dash c the pre consolidation pressure to the uh, present effective ore burden pressure. So normally for uh, normally consolidated soils OCR will be in the range of 1 to you can say 2 and uh, the any uh, value of OCR greater than uh, 2 uh, is called likely ore consolidated soils and there can be some soils because of the, the past. Uh, existence of the structures and some glaciation activity which might have taken place in that particular uh, uh, site because of the history there is a possibility that the OCR can uh, can have value up to 9 to 15 or so. So highly war consolidated soils they actually have they would have undergone the consolidation and the water content in those uh, soils is very less in case of normally consolidated soils they are soft in nature and uh, have very high water content and uh, compressible in nature. So before looking into this example problem which we will discuss let us look into this particular slide wherein we have distributed we have got a you know a, a bottom which is actually having an impervious and assume that there is a soil which is actually has got a, a stage 1 deposition. And then uh, the soil is actually deposit, uh, getting deposited here and the deposition process is actually happening and this is the uh, water level in the sea, lake or estuary where estuary is nothing but where wide uh, portion of the uh, uh, river where it meets the sea. So the sigma versus z is this is nothing but this is what uh, you know pore water pressure and then this is effective stress in stage 1. So when the deposition actually happens uh, then the when the deposition is happening in stage 2 the height of the soil uh, deposited increases with that what will happen is that uh, this element undergoes uh, increase in the effective stress and uh, uh, what will happen is that the effective stress increases from sigma 1 dash to sigma d dash. So the element is subjected to increase in effective stress from sigma 1 dash to sigma 2 dash. So this is plotted for the element here for this element which is at a certain point which is actually selected in stage 1 and stage 2 and wherein it actually says that E and versus log sigma dash. So this is the stage 1 point where up to that the stress actually has been subjected in an element A is sigma 1 dash this is because of the, the deposition of the soil and stage 2 because of the stress increase from sigma 1 to sigma 2 that is delta sigma is increase in incremental effect, effective stress this is stage 2 and if this actually is point A is sigma c dash that is the pre consolidation pressure. So this is said to be in the normally consolidated state. So, so this is the past stress history and this is for the E, e sigma dash which is actually shown here past stress history and the present state and then loading when it actually happens again it goes into the uh, normally consolidated mode here. So this is uh, you know a true NC clay would only be exist in current deposition environment one more thing is that this normally consolidated uh, soils the continuous deposition actually take place mostly these are also called as ang deposits uh, river uh, such as in river estuary lake or coastal region where the water level has always remained above the uh, soil level and where it would not have been affected by any other process which might produce ore consolidation which might produce ore consolidation. So a true normally considered clay would only exist in current deposition environment such as river estuary lake or coastal region where water level has always remained above the sea level above the soil level where it would not have been affected by any other process which might have produced ore consolidation. And during the deposition what will happen is that the grain structure of the soil element will be adjusting to changes in void ratio mostly the structural rearrangement of the soil particles takes place 
So that is why the along the compression line there is uh, uh, you know the constant uh, uh, you know compression undergoes and then the uh, as the because of the deposition the stress keeps on in effective stress keeps on increasing. And this process where the particles move closer is an irreversible process so that the original particle arrangement could not be recovered even if the stresses are removed. Whereas in case of uh, ore consolidated uh, clay what we said is that this is the present ground level but the past maximum ground level was here. Uh, this can be with the ice or be with the soil where either it would have been eroded it been subjected to erosion or uh, this uh, ice which was actually there was subjected to say glaciation. So in that case now the war burden which was there as uh, was the soil where in which the soil strata was subjected will not be existing now but the past uh, you know uh, it was actually subjected. So in this case what will happen is that with the present uh, war burden this is sigma naught dash and the and after deposition uh, you know this this is the path. So what will happen is that uh, we can see that the OSER actually decreases with uh, as the sigma, da, sigma naught dash increases or with the Z or sigma naught dash the OSER variation will be there uh, with, uh, with increase which uh, increases uh, uh, which decreases with an increase in sigma naught dash. So here uh, OCR is actually defined as sigma C dash by sigma naught dash which is nothing but uh, we can write 1 plus sigma C dash minus sigma naught dash by sigma naught dash. So in this sigma C dash minus sigma naught dash which is actually constant and uh, this is actually for the ore consolidated uh, portion. In, in the case of OC clay uh, basically this is the clay that has been uh, subjected to effective stress in the past stress history and sigma C dash larger than the effective stress existing at the point at the point sigma naught, sigma naught dash. So on removal of the stress the soil skeleton swells but only the reversible components like elastic strains in particular and uh, uh, compression of water molecules attracted around each particles they are recovered and so that the void ratio increases are smaller and the erosion uh, line uh, follows a, a flatter uh, path. So uh, what we have understood is that the normally consolidated and uh, uh, the war consolidated soils are distinctly different and normal consolidated soils undergo uh, you know the large compression and they have very high water contents and uh, by knowing uh, liquid limits we can also determine what is the compression index from the order of the compression index values we can actually determine. In case of uh, war consolidated soils so the soil would have been already subjected to consolidation. So in here in this constant uh, in this uh, context we can actually say that the soil uh, particularly fine grain soil or clay is very sensitive to, uh, to the stress history. So uh, then uh, uh, in this uh, uh, particular lecture what we try to introduce ourselves uh, to the uh, you know the so called uh, you know how we can actually do uh, the iodometer test uh, for determining the consolidation characteristics of soils. So from the iodometer test what we can actually get is that compression index and coefficient of volume compressibility and, uh, uh, and then also we can actually get uh, by we have uh, popular two methods are there for determining the coefficient of consolidation with those methods. Uh, uh, we can actually get the variation of the coefficient of consolidation with the time and as we have discussed that coefficient of consolidation and coefficient of permeability are uh, uh, related. So by using that relation we can also uh, obtain what is the change in uh, uh, coefficient of permeability when actually happens with, uh, with increase in the effective stress.